this last week has been hard. My son, who's wired so much like me, my my wife points that out all the time. Uh, he's been leaving things behind. Well, and it's understandable. He's he's missing things. He's got a trombone. He's got to remember, but not every day. Every other day, just on on B or A days, not the B days at school. He's got a uh, an iPad. He's got to remember. He's got soccer stuff. There's just a lot to remember. There's just special things. Right now, they're in a unit where he's got to bring a bike helmet to school on top of all that. So there's a lot to remember. So things have been forgotten. So I've made it into my habit to walk around. I remember there's a particular day last week. I was walking around one last lap around the house before we were going to leave. I looked in the bedroom, looked in the dining room, looked in the kitchen, end up in the living room. None of his stuff was anywhere. Then I looked to the side and there was my briefcase. Everything that I was gonna, going to need for my day was right there. My computer, books, resources, papers, everything I needed. I walked around the house that day because I was going to help my son. It turns out I was the one missing something. And it's amazing to me how there's so many times in life we go into things and we think it's for someone else and it ends up being for us. Today's story, the Good Samaritan, is one that you're probably familiar with. If you've been around the church for any length of time, you know, you know that story. It's in popular culture. I just took a first aid class and we were told that there's a Good Samaritan law. If you ever treat someone uh, just out in public with some first aid training, as long as you stay within the scope of the training you received, you're protected under the Good Samaritan law from being sued for trying to care for someone. They want people to look after one another. The Good Samaritan is an incredible story that highlights just what God looks for in his people. It's got a remarkable background. One day, an expert in the law a religious lawyer. He was scrupulous in understanding the scriptures. He probably had memorized much of the Old Testament. In a culture and place where everybody spoke Greek, he knew Hebrew, a completely different language. He'd probably written briefs on some of the more difficult passages. And he came to Jesus with a plan to test him. He had everything in his mind laid out about how he was going to help Jesus learn a lesson. He was going to show everybody what they needed to know. And Jesus turned the tables that day and showed the lawyer what he needed to know. That story is familiar to everyone. And it would be so easy for someone listening to this, watching this, that they would say, well, maybe, maybe it's for someone else. But I believe all of us are missing something, and we can learn from it today. Hi, I'm Pastor Joe Carlson. I'm so glad that you can join with us today. I hope that this message infiltrates your mind, your heart, and helps you think through what your world and what your life might be about. This message gets into one of the most important questions ever asked. How do I get eternal life? It talks about what we believe. It talks about the Old Testament. And we'll get into some passages from the Old Testament. It gets into all these things. But at the end of the day, it's what Jesus would have his people know and believe and do. The verse of the week is something the lawyer said in this interaction. It's in Luke chapter 10, verse 27. It says there, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the man was told, or that's what the man said when asked, what is eternal life? He had his ducks in a row. He had his mind sorted. He knew the Old Testament. He had understanding. He had a grasp of the scriptures. But he was missing something just like all of us can. Jesus confirms the man was spot on. He was right where he needed to be. 
But then he goes on to tell a story that transforms and has continued to transform our world. The story we're looking at today is built hospitals, uprooted racism, it has stopped, it has stopped class divisions. It is for the heart of that lawyer and it's for mine and yours. Listen to it for your world and the people you think might need it, but listen to it for your sake as well. You may be missing something. By the way, if you want to know more about what's going on at Bethany and what we're doing, what we're all about, we encourage you to go to our website, bethanyscofield.org. There's next steps there. There's the outreach we're doing to the Afghan refugees that are moving into our community. There's a women's retreat. There's youth ministry. There's children's ministry. There's all kinds of things happening at Bethany Church. But these are not just activities, so we have things to do. It's because we believe that God wants us to impact our world and to change it. And the website is a great place to start. With that all said, let's look at this Good Samaritan story. This is in Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of, of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So to a Levite, and when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for the extra expense you have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell to the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go. Jesus took the question that the man asked, how do we inherit inter eternal life? And he used a story to illustrate what we need to be about. The story of the Good Samaritan could be understood by a child. You could tell the story to a kindergarten. They could probably grasp some important elements in it. But it takes a whole lifetime to live this out. Lay aside your grasp of the story. Lay aside what you remember from it. And just consider with fresh ears what Jesus was trying to communicate that day. First thing in the story is that we should believe. It's what we believe and it's, it's pertinent. It's important. What we believe matters. The lawyer came to Jesus and put him to the test. He was asking a vital question. How do I inherit eternal life? According to Billy Graham, 19 times Jesus was asked that question, and it's an important question. How do I inherit eternal life? The, everything about this life could it, it hinges on the answer to that question. It, it, depending on how we answer, it changes the trajectory of everything we might do. And the test from the lawyer, it was designed to divide people. He was on purpose asking a question because there were people in that day they didn't believe there was life after death. There was other people that believed there was a certain way to that afterlife. And depending on what you believe, it's the camp that you belonged into. And there's division in that day and age, just like there is today. Just like people today debate and wonder where this lies. It's led to the religions of our world, the different opinions, the different, and the great, chaos that happens in our lifetime. Some said live for today. Who cares about anything else? Some people said care about eternity and they gave the pathway to it. As I read this story and I read that question, I realized the Bible was not written just for ancient people. It was written for today. 
The things that are said and the things that are done here point out that question is still relevant. You could ask that same question of someone in any walk of life and it matters what the answer is. I was driving down Grand Ave. There's a bar on the side and it's got the answer, $2 domestics. Then you go past that, there's a car dealership. Perhaps a new car would give you meaning in life. It gives you something for right now. And that's how people are getting through this life. They're finding something to fill it along the way. And if you go far enough, you'll find a cemetery, including a plot for people that are Jewish, and I would imagine Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus. This question about where is eternal life, it matters. It matters to me and it matters to you. So how do I inherit eternal life? Luke chapter 10, 25 and 26 says this, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? We've got to know the answer to this question. To struggle with this question is a good thing. Should we be pursuing money? Should we put family first? What about fame? C.S. Lewis said this once. I love this quote. Do not let your happiness, or I think you could replace happiness, do not let your life depend on something that you may lose. And the entire world waits on this answer. And that question from 2,000 years ago is relevant for today. I've seen people answer that question and they pursue broken, broken and breaking relationship after relationship. I see pictures of people risking their life to flee their country to come to ours. They look at their life and say, there's something more to it. They put things into it. And I can tell you without a doubt what Jesus, and the reason why he's so relevant is because without Jesus, there is no hope. Jesus answers the question with a question. He understands and he knows that digging deeper, going past the surface answer is the hope that we have. And this has not changed. 2,000 years, he is still the hope that we need. Why do we listen to the stories at Bethany? Why do we light the candle? Why do we put stars on the wall? Because no hope makes life impossible. We need the answer to this question. This last week, a lady stopped in she was asking for prayer for her daughter for healing, for, for a heart problem. But she said, you know what the real thing I need? I would really love for, for to know for, for sure that she's put her faith and hope in Jesus Christ. And we get to the end of our days, that is what will matter. So after he asked the, the lawyer asked the question. Jesus asked a question. What does the law say? And that gives us to number two in this, in this outline today. The bylaws or the laws that are written. What does the law say? What does this book that we've been given tell us about eternal life? Jesus answers this question by helping the lawyer know you got to go deeper. Don't just look at the surface. Let's go down. Asking a question that caused the lawyer used to asking questions to answer it himself and go deeper backed him up. It put him on his heels. He was missing something. And Jesus didn't want him to miss it one more day. Having a grasp of all the Bible, having things memorized is not the final answer. But he was going somewhere with this. He knew that this lawyer knew the Hebrew text and he was ready to, to do, do something with it. And Jesus asked him a difficult question and I'm, I'm amazed at how he can deliver. Jesus' question was, what is written in the law? How would you read it? So on the spot, Jesus asked him the entire Bible, especially the Old Testament, how would you summarize the Bible? And it's, it's as if the man could, boom, deliver it right in that moment. And he goes into his answer. So what is written in God's word? What does it say? Knowing what God's word says matters. One of the most significant and marks of a mature believer is that they're looking intently into the word of God. You can read about that in James 1 verse 25. It, 
It is something that comes inside of us and transforms us. And this is what we must do. And it's good to do that on Sunday at church. But it's good to do that on Monday through Saturday as well. We must look intently into the Word of God because it transforms. It, it transforms us. Hebrews 4.12 says it cuts to the bone and marrow. So Jesus is not ignoring the question. He's instead pointing, this is life. This book in front of us is the answer. What does God want for his believers? To look on social media and see what people are saying. To hear what the media is telling us. To hear what our political leaders are saying. He doesn't say that once. That's not in the Bible even one time. He reminds us again and again, look in here. And yet, what do we do all the time? We, How many minutes compared to how much we've looked into the Bible in this last week? How many minutes have we put into anything else besides God's word? I would urge you to look at your life, look at your schedule, look at what you've done. How much time have you looked intently into this word of God? What does it say? It's alive. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts to the mirror, cuts deeply into our hearts and lives and transforms us. So what do we do? Well, the the lawyer answers wisely and correctly. He goes back to Levitic, sorry, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. In Deuteronomy 6, 6, verse 5, it's perhaps the most memorized verses in the world. In 6, verse 5, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength. Lay aside everything. This verse says it perfect, perfectly. Everything from your mind, your heart, soul, strength, everything in you should be dedicated to God. There lies eternal life. And this can't be done. This is our calling, but it cannot be done because no one can live up to that expectation. When we sin, we are ultimately falling short of this command. In Psalm 51, Jesus, or David writes about how against you and you alone I have sinned. But if you know anything about what his context was, that doesn't make sense. He had committed adultery with Bathsheba. He had murdered Uriah the Hittite. And yet he says, I've sinned against God. How is that even possible? Well, David understood something. Our ultimate one we have to live up to is not the people around you. That's like a comparison to your peers. We have to live up to God's standard, what Jesus' standards are. That's infinite, infinitely high. But there's more than that. We can't live up to that standard because we'd have to be like God. We can't do that. But then he goes beyond. The, the man wisely says, well, then you also have to look at loving your neighbor as yourself. This is Leviticus chapter 19, verses 3 and 4. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 and 34. When an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. <laughs> I look at that verse and I think, my goodness, what a verse for our times. Have you ever heard about people, refugees, coming to our area? About 30 years ago, the Hmong moved into our community. Right now, it looks like Afghan people or others may be moving into our community. Well, we're given a clear declaration of what to do in those times. What do we do? Well, the alien living among you must be treated like one of your native born. Treat them the same. I, I, I'm not making this up. It's what it says. Love him as yourself, for you are aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. That's impossible as well. How can we even do this? There's so many reasons why we shouldn't. Can we go through the list of things that we, reasons why, of the risk, the danger? You're opening yourself up to problems by doing this. Can you, let's just for a moment, think of all the problems. And yet the Lord points back, but that is what you were. Treat people differently at risk to yourself. To live this out means treating the world like Jesus does. Well, the lawyer 
says, this is crazy. I, you got you to gotta narrow this down. Like a good lawyer, he tries to justify and narrow, limit his liability. He says, wait a minute, Jesus, to justify himself. What exactly are you saying? What exactly are, do you mean with this? He says here, and wanting to justify himself in verse 29 of Luke chapter 10, it says, so, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The guy next door? Somebody I work with? Maybe someone down the street? What, what exactly is this about? The, real, the lawyer realized it's impossible what Leviticus asked for. So he tries to narrow it down. This verse and this passage was written for a time and place for back then as it is now. We constantly look for ways that we can narrow down our responsibility, take away, make it more reasonable what we're expected to do. And it can't be done. What this verse is asking us to do, it cannot be done. So instead of narrowing it down, what does Jesus do? He expands the narrative of who the neighbor is. Love your children even when they disobey? Sure enough. Love your wife even when she doesn't do what you expect? Sure. Love your political leaders? Love your neighbor. I think so. Love your fellow citizens? But if you met some of the citizens around us, what about the people moving into our area? Jesus gives a completely baffling response. Instead of answering, instead of going straight to the mind, he goes to the heart. And if we're paying attention, we realize we are all missing something. And this isn't just for the people down the road from you today. It might be for you. And it is for me. So let's look at the final thing, the story narrative, the behavior. Jesus jumps out of the written law, jumps out of the questions and tells a story. And he used a provocative example. The hero of the story is a Samaritan. Unbelievable. A good Jewish person would say they're half-breeds. They, they don't even believe, they're not even fully connected to Abraham. They didn't worship at the temple. So they were not following the, the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, correctly. They were doing things wrong. They had desecrated the temple. This is what the Samaritans had done. They had taken, one time they had taken bones and thrown them into the Holy of Holies. These are bad people. And like Romans, then they're, they were bad, but they were far worse than that to the, to the lawyer. He was stretching the lawyer's mind. As I look at the story, I realize that the conceit that we can have, that I have sometimes, that I'm better than that. I don't see it that way. It condemns us. Now, I, a commentator, one commentator I was, read was trying to put this, a, a man named D.A. Carson, an excellent uh, speaker and commentator, trying to put this in the context for today, says, well, think of it maybe like this. A Muslim imam was walking down the Jericho Road. While provocative, it's clear Jesus is trying to make a point. It is no accident that he picks a Samaritan for a story. He's trying to get to the heart of matters. Jesus is getting to the lawyer's heart. He's seeking to get to ours. Does the world need this message? Yes, and it was meant for you and I. And the story is powerful. And it fits today and it will fit always. And it cuts to the very nature of who we are as believers. I know what I believe, and perhaps you know what you believe, but how are we practicing it? Is it stretching our faith? Is it pushing the limits of what it means to inherit eternal life? I would have loved, it would have made so much more sense. It would have been easier for Jesus to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the answer for eternal life, right? That's Jesus. That's what we should look for. But instead, he tells a story about a Samaritan who doesn't even believe the right stuff. It doesn't fit the definition of what we want. It sounds like works-based religion. It's outside of the law. So let's look into the story. Luke 10, 30 through 37 is that story and takes place on the Jericho Road. Maybe a road similar to this where someone could come out of anywhere. 
and ambush, ambush this. According to historian Josephus, around the time that the story was told by Jesus, 40,000 workers had been laid off in the Jerusalem Temple Mount. So all these people had suddenly lost work. They had no resources. So it was believed by some that many lived on the Jericho Road or ambushed people on the Jericho Road to make their, their living. Jesus was putting a story in the context of the people of their time. He uses characters that they would have grasped and understood. He's trying to put, put your mind, wrap your mind around what could have been happening. The people in the story would have grasped, yes, that road is dangerous. Can you think of ways how living in this world is dangerous for today? Can you think of ways or places living out our faith is risky and could cause great loss? Uh, on purpose, Jesus brings us to this dangerous territory to help us think through what it will mean. It is reason reasonable to think there is fear and risk and danger in living out this message, because there is. Later on in the story, I find this fascinating. The, the, the Samaritan man is going down this road. He's beaten and left half dead. And in verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the same road happened okay is there any accident that jesus put happened into that road or any of the characters got mentioned no way there is no chance in this jesus intentionally included that phrase and those workers because there is no chance he on purpose places his believers in times and places where things can happen where situations will come up it's not accident that a priest and then a Levite and the Samaritan are the characters introduced in the story. And it's no accident for the situations we will come to in our world. We're going to come across things that will happen to be. But we live in this time and the place because God is trying to move us from a head knowledge of who he is and drive this message deep into our hearts so it transforms the way we live. It is no accident. I believe that God puts us in the circumstances and places we have on purpose to bring us to himself. Well, what happens? There's a religious leader reaction. The priest and Levi saw the situation, saw the man on the side of the road, and moved on. So why did they move on? We can speculate, but we really don't know. <laughs> did they want to stay clean? Were they more worried about their religious obligations? than fulfilling their moral requirement? Perhaps. Maybe they, they were on their way to the Jericho Road Committee meeting down in Jericho, and they didn't want to be late. Otherwise, people wouldn't be safe on the road. I'm, of course, making that up. But it's reasonable and expected this could be a way people would act. This falls short of the way we should live. I want to remind you, eternal life is on the line. So what is the Samaritan's reaction? It's about need, not me. It's interesting to me. Luke, the physician, is the only one that records what the Samaritan did. He stopped, bound up the wounds of the man. He treated it with oil, which was had healing properties. He, he, he took away some of the infection with alcohol or the wine. He is on purpose not given the identity. We're not told the identity of the man because it didn't matter. The identity of the man in the situation did not matter. It's whoever, it's every man, it's anyone you might meet, any situation you might meet where there is need. And the, the Samaritan gives up his time, his talent, and his treasure to meet that need. Reminding me of the, the, the parable of the, the talents from just last week that we looked at. He stretches the listener to strive for more. Jesus is going on from, from just what we believe to our behavior. Jesus is getting to his mission. He didn't just come for us to believe things. He came to change hearts. 
And it's only when our belief leads to action that we can know that our hearts are in the right place. Jesus always came to not just move our minds, but to move our, our lives. Good doctrine, correct doctrine is important, and we should have that. But it is inseparable from the behavior we must have. This story is about eternal life. <laughs> you know how the, so the lawyer finishes the story? He can't even say the word Samaritan. Jesus asked him, so who is my neighbor? And the, the, man re, the man replied, the one who had mercy on him. He can't even get himself to say the, so, so, the guy who helped. And that's what Jesus would want for us to do as well. Be honest with our situation. Where have we fallen short? What do we need? In conclusion, I'd like you to think about the attitudes of the people in the story. The expert in the law, the wounded man in the story to the lawyer was a subject to discuss, a person to consider and contemplate. And the lawyer was just assuming, if I can just stay in my lane and keep my eyes shut, stay away from this world, I'll be fine. I, he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to know, within the law, how can I be okay? But Jesus was never going to let him just be okay with that. The wounded man is not just uh, an example out there. It's for how the heart can be transformed. Robbers, the robbers in the story, to them, the wounded man was someone to exploit. Many people in this world look to take advantage of others. And that's what we should expect. We should not be surprised when we see it because that's the world, man. Look out there and that's what's going on. But Jesus it's interesting to me, does not condemn the robbers. It just mentioned it as if a fact to happen. Robbers are going to rob. Haters are going to hate. We live in that world, and that creates opportunity. He doesn't justify the robbers. He just says it happens. The religious men, the wounded man was someone to avoid. In their hearts, they knew they didn't want anything by him. The problem about the wounded man on the side of the road, they never arrive at opportune times. It doesn't come in a neat package with a prepared place. They come in the wrong places. The Jericho Road was a problematic place. Keep moving or you will get robbed. You stick around and help that wounded man, you could be robbed yourself. There are reasons for doing what they did. They weren't valid. But it is dreadfully easy for us to become just like them. The innkeeper, the wounded man, was a customer that he could serve for a fee. He could advance his position. He could take him in at his inn. And he took that money, as far as we know. But what do you think happened to that innkeeper? I'd like to know the discussion around his dinner table that night. He's talk, I can just imagine he's talking to his wife. You'll never believe it. Some Samaritan dropped off a guy, somebody he doesn't even know, and paid me money for someone that he doesn't even know. That's a story we're sharing. That causes people to look into what are they thinking about, what are they doing. It must have blown his mind to think someone did, would do that. Maybe he laughed on his way to the bank. But I got a feeling he looked at his own life and did things differently. Perhaps that would happen to us too. As we live out our faith, what happens to the world around us? What kind of example does it make to our world? The Samaritan, the wounded man, was a human being worth loving, worth caring for. Think about what it cost him. It cost him at least a day. It took him money. took risk. In so many ways, this is a bad idea. He could have kept on moving and no one would have known otherwise. But Jesus, on purpose... Puts him in a risky situation that don't neatly fit. I believe Jesus does the same thing for us today. He doesn't put neat situations in front of us. He gives us life. And those life situations, those difficult times, and we're not going to do it perfectly, perfectly, but I can tell you, the, the place to begin to bring heart change is to do something badly and start at it and learn along the way. The Samaritan had to learn some lessons, but he did it. And it's transformed our world ever since. The last character, he's not mentioned in the story, but we 
We know him. It's Jesus. He realized that all of these characters and all of us are worth dying for. In some ways, we're all of those characters. There's been times we've put our doctrine and laws in front of caring for people. There's times that we saw a situation and we avoided them. There's times that we took advantage of others because we knew something they didn't. And there's times that we've helped. There's times that we've made a difference. We, there's been times we've discussed the finer points of theology and justified why we don't need to do things. And Jesus died for all of us in every situation. So what is eternal life? Some next steps for you to consider. First of all, to live this out, to apply this this week. What question is God stretching you with? Has Jesus been asking a question on your heart about what you should be about, what you can be about? This is not just the way he worked back then. It's how he works today. Secondly, where have you limited or justified your limiting of responsibility? Have you stopped short of what you could do? Has an opportunity been placed or have you avoided that Jericho road just because you don't want to risk possibly seeing that thing? Finally, how would God want you to live out your belief? You believe something. If you're hearing this message, you might believe something about Jesus. How does God want you to live out what you say you believe? The verse of the week, the one I hope that you consider and carefully put to heart. It's what a, a lawyer that knew well he said this and answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Let me ask you this. If you were to summarize the entire word of God in a sentence or two, how would you do it? How would you lay out the entire word of God simply and succinctly? And then how would you live it? Because that's the answer to what is eternal life. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the story of the Good Samaritan. May we be people that don't just hear these words, but we put them to heart. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless and have a great week.